Hello and welcome everybody to our 16th Holding Space for Self and Others webinar. It's lovely to have you here this evening, this morning or wherever you're coming in from. My name is Jackie Short, I'm the Clinical Director of Sydney Centre for Creative Change and we've got a wonderful webinar in store for you tonight. Welcome one and all, it's lovely to see your faces and thank you for keeping your cameras on mute just so we've got really great sound quality for the hour that we have together tonight. I'd like to introduce and welcome uh, Kelly Hunter to you in just a moment. But before we do that, what I'd like to do is also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that I come to you from today, the Eora people of the Gadigal Nation and pay our collective respects to elders past, present and emerging around our country. And welcome all our Indigenous brothers, sisters and colleagues here tonight, as well as everybody here and our international guests. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for tuning in. This presentation is being recorded. It'll be edited and available up on the website in a couple of weeks, along with a quiz. And if you do the quiz after viewing the video, Aidan will send you a certificate for PD for those who require it for their professional development services. So welcome. I am going to quickly screen share to give you an idea of what we're going to be doing in our time together tonight. So what we have tonight is a presentation on the Hunter Heartbeat workshop, which are sensory games for autistic individuals and their families. Our key note guest this evening is Kelly Hunter, who I'm going to introduce in just a moment. And after she's done her presentation, we're going to have about five or 10 minutes for some time to connect in with two or three other people in small groups to be able to reflect on what Kelly shared with us tonight. Then we're going to have a little prize giveaway and somebody will win a drama therapy workshop and it's perfectly apt given that Kelly herself is an actress. Kelly is the artistic director of Flute Theatre and has created some fabulous Shakespeare adaptations for children, adolescents and adults with ASD. And they're all based on parts of Shakespeare's plays. She's gonna talk a little bit about this tonight. She tools internationally and she's developed a method called the Hunter Heartbeat Method, which is a way of helping people with autism communicate better and be able to express their emotions more effectively. One of the challenges that Kelly's going to be sharing with us tonight, as many of us have been challenged with this year, is how to work in a COVID time online. Kelly's work has been recognised by the MBE she was awarded last year, and we're very, very excited to have her here with us tonight. So thank you so much, Kelly, for giving up your time and coming on board. And I know she's open to questions, so please feel free to put your questions in the chat box, and uh, she's going to be answering those directly tonight. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, hello. Uh, really great to see you. Thank you so much. So I'm talking to you from London, where it is sunny and 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. I want to share with you the work I do, the Hunter Heartbeat method that I've created over the last two decades, which takes the essence of Shakespeare's plays and offers them to individuals with autism, mainly the most are profoundly affected. So those who are non-verbal, those who everyone says, no one can play with my child or my brother or my sister or my parent. Um, they are the, the forgotten and the marginalized. I want to share with you five short films. So I'm gonna take you through five ways that I use Shakespeare and what the direct relationship with the Shakespeare is with the struggles that someone with autism has. And then I'm going to show a clip of the children that we play with before COVID and post COVID. All the clips contain uh, vulnerable people who uh, we have permission from all their families and all their schools to show this. And you can also show it, um, it'll be recorded for you and you have permission to show these films anywhere else. So the first thing I want to talk about is the struggle with time and the perception of time that an individual who is autistic will experience. So people on the spectrum struggle quite literally with the perception and the concept of time. Now this means at its worst that the next moment of time 
is something to be terrified of because you don't know how long it's going to last. You don't know what it's going to entail. You don't know how it's going to be. For some people on the spectrum, literally taking the next breath and entering the next beat of time is very, very frightening. So you can think of the experience of autism as an extended panic attack that never finishes because the next moment is not secure. Many people who are artistic ask you what the time is. How long is this gonna last? When is this gonna finish? And it's not because they're bored and it's not because they're rude. It's because quite literally, the idea of something stretching on forever is too terrifying. So obviously everyone on the autistic spectrum is an individual first, a human being within full landscape of feelings and emotions, and the autism impedes their experience of life. So I don't label people autistic and therefore they are in another group of human beings. They are simply human beings who have, if you like, an exaggerated version of the panic that we can all struggle with. Shakespeare writes his plays in the rhythm of a heartbeat. So there's something called the iambic pentameter, which is quite literally boom, 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 the rhythm of the human heart. Now that rhythm changes depending on what a character is thinking and feeling, but primarily there is a human heartbeat at the center of Shakespeare's plays. So when I begin my work, I always ask people to think about their own heartbeat, first of all. Now, if the door behind you in the room that you're in swung open and a great big grizzly bear came lumbering in, your heartbeats would register that straight away. Actually, before the brain registers, the heartbeat, the adrenaline just goes, oh, panic, and boom, something happens to your heart. If the door swung open and the person who broke your heart 25 years ago and you never got over it properly walked in, you might not show it in your face, but oh my God, your heartbeat would register it. So your heartbeat never lies. Your heartbeat is the barometer of your true feelings. You cannot tell your heartbeat to go a different way. Your heartbeat literally is you. It's the fundamental part of you and you need no spoken word to register your feelings. Your heartbeat is doing it for you. So knowing yourself, understanding your own heartbeat will allow you to empathize with someone whose heartbeat 24 seven is going like a kitten. I work with very small children as well as everybody else on the spectrum. Um, two, three, four year olds. And I have them on my knee and I rock them and I make heartbeats with them. And the rate of heartbeat, the rate of speed is honestly like a tiny little kitten. It's so fast. So there is panic in the interior experience of someone on the spectrum. So, Shakespeare writes his plays with this beautiful pulsing heartbeat. And I start my workshops and my sessions and my performances and whenever I am with someone with autism by sharing my heartbeat with them. And I purposefully make it a little bit slower than it would normally be. And I literally sit like this in a room, making the rhythm of a heartbeat like this. And in this way, I'm offering my steady heartbeat to someone who is panicking. And I don't say a word. It's conversation of the body and the soul rather than conversation of the spoken word. So I don't say, come on, we're gonna do heartbeats, you must calm down, that would be horrible. I literally am sharing the interior rhythm of this heartbeat. This allows me to work with people who don't speak the same language as me, the same spoken word, because the language is of the body and the heart. And pre-COVID, myself and my company 
would sit in rooms, in theatres, in community centres, wherever we were invited to be, in countries across the world, and we would sit and offer our heartbeats to a maximum of 15 individuals at a time for about an hour. We would begin with our heartbeats and then we'd play our games, which I'm going to show you. Since COVID, we couldn't be in the rooms anymore. We couldn't share in the rooms our heartbeats. And I was absolutely determined last March and April when the lockdown in this country started not to lose contact with the families that I work with and not to lose contact with the people that we play with. So we, my company and I, started offering our work online through Zoom. It was a bit tricky at first because we just had to work out how to do it. But we've managed to keep contact with the families. And very interestingly, some autistic children find it more comfortable to be behind the screen and to be making the heartbeats and actually communicating and playing with us from behind the screen. So I don't think there's a, a better or a worse or a good or a bad way of doing this. There's many ways of sharing our heartbeats. So what I'm gonna do is show you a little clip. It's about five minutes long. It has footage of us using the heartbeat in the real space over the last few years with different individuals with autism. And then it has footage of us using the Zoom and you see how we've adapted it and how the individuals are still communicating with us. And then included in that is a little boy called Lumen who's eight years old, who's been playing with us for a couple of years and actually spoke for the first time after making his heartbeats with us for all this time. We add the word hello. So we make the heartbeat and then we add hello, hello, hello to give it a little context. So those who are verbal can join us with the hellos. And if you're not verbal, it doesn't matter. But what was interesting is Lumen came for quite a couple of years and then amazingly his mother captured the moment where he was, she was making heartbeats with him and he actually said hello for the first time. So by calming the interior rhythm of the individuals, we've allowed them to trust themselves, to trust their bodies, to trust their own rhythms in order to reach out and communicate to others. So I'm gonna ask you, I'm sure you are all muted. Um, that's great, please maintain muted. I'll share this for the next five minutes and you'll watch the heartbeats. Here we go. <laughs> Hello, 
I pass my face to <laughs> you. Your turn, Lila. Hello. <gasps> Hello. Hello. One more. Hello. You throw the face back to me. <laughs> Hello, honey. Hello, bottle. And I'm passing it to you. Passing it to you. <sighs> hello, Hepsi. Hello, Hepsi. Hello, Hepsi. Hello. Hello, Hepsi. Hello, Hepsi. And we're passing it to you. Hello, Lumen, hello, Lumen, hello, Lumen, hello. Hello, to. Hello, to. Hello, to. Hello. 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 Goodbye, Caspin. Goodbye, Caspin. Goodbye, Caspin. Goodbye. Goodbye, Caspin. Goodbye, Caspin. Goodbye. Goodbye. Great. Uh, could you give me a thumbs up that that worked and that you saw it and heard it? Amazing. All right. Um, it's quite a thing, the London to Australia thing. Uh, great, I'm so glad. So what you saw there was just uh, as a kind of example of the range of people, children and people with autism that we work with, some very verbal, some non-verbal, some young, some a little bit older. Um, and you saw us also making different expressions and faces within the hellos. So autistic individuals struggle, can struggle, with recognizing facial expressions and making different facial expressions. A woman with autism that I know in Sweden actually told me that she didn't know where her face is. She, of course, she knows she has a face, but she says when she wants to express herself, she doesn't know where that bit of herself is. So it's what I call the disassociation of mind and body. And our Shakespeare characters give us an incredible starting point for expression. Uh, characters in Shakespeare are wholly generic to start off with. So Hamlet is very depressed, King Lear is mad, Juliet is in love. We have wonderful things that you can really hold on to. It's not that they're not subtle, but you can really read them. And so we whittle that down to offering particular expressions that the autistic individual can practice making. So you saw us throwing not just the hello on the Zoom, but actually creating it into a feeling. So throwing a happy hello or a surprised hello or a disgusted hello or whatever. And it's really important that we find what I call an exaggerated truth. So there's no point in sort of underplaying it and trying to be cool because the person with autism is struggling to find the cues, struggling to see what it is that, that they can copy or get hold of. So if you've got actors who are wonderfully open and having this broad, exaggerated truth, it's not fake, it's true, then you have something that the uh, child can actually hold on to. It's as if the actor is at a million percent, bang, there they are. The, 
child is struggling with knowing how to communicate and that million and that, that zero collide and there you get the sharing. It's not that we are right and they are wrong. There is no success or failure, right or wrong in this work. There is a sharing of what it feels like to be alive and to have emotions and how you express them. So crucially in Shakespeare, there are four key words that run through his plays and appear more than any other words in the plays. And they're very simple. They are eyes, mind, reason, and love. These four key words, your eyes, your mind, your reason, and your love. It's as if Shakespeare is writing about characters who use their eyes and their mind to find and express their reason and their love. So in A Midsummer Night's Dream, Helena says, love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind. That's just one line with three of those words packed in together. Now, autistic individuals struggle at varying levels of degree with using their eyes and their mind to express their reason and their love. Many autistic individuals struggle with making eye contact. The more verbal will tell you that it hurts. And if you don't ever make eye contact, you don't allow yourself to be known and you definitely don't allow yourself to be loved. In my experience, I now understand it as less a fear of doing the looking, but more a fear of being looked at. Because if we allow someone to look at us and, and share some eye contact, we'll be known. And I'm sure all of us experience that. Falling in love, being known is not easy. We all are fearful of rejection. We are all um, tentative. But what you get with autism is an exaggeration of that fear and no strategy whatsoever to overcome the fear. So instead of trying to overcome the fear that a normal human being would have, you get panic and trepidation. And actually, I just fell into the trap of saying normal, but I'm just going to say human being. So I created, when I first started this work, games of eye contact, games where people on the autistic spectrum could play with making eye contact with others. In The Tempest, Prospero says, at the first sight, they have changed eyes when he sees Miranda and Ferdinand fall in love. And there's this beautiful idea there that you change eyes with someone. Not only does that mean that you look for longer because you think they're very attractive, but also that you can see the world through their eyes, which is love and empathy. And my God, we all need to do that. See the world through somebody else's eyes. So these games of eye contact are fundamental for this work. It's as though Shakespeare's exploration of eyes, mind, reason, and love gives us this deep sea in which to explore the world of autism. In Midsummer Night's Dream, we land on the eyes of Titania, the ears, the hearing of Bottom, the hands of Puck, and the hearts of the lovers. So there's this sensory experience in Shakespeare that allows us to play with individuals who are autistic and share a conversation of the body and a conversation of the soul. So I'm going to show you now the next clip, which is games of eye contact. Again, we'll do the same thing. So we will show us playing these games in the real space and then how we've played them on the Zoom. I've just had a message. I can't see the video, just the title page. Oh no. Did anybody else have that experience? Uh, maybe Aidan, you could help Katie. Amazing. Okay, thanks. Oh. <laughs> so here we go. I'm going to share this, um, this second little clip. So these are games of eye contact coming from Shakespeare's key words, eyes, mind, reason, and love, and showing how we've adapted our games of eye contact from real space to the virtual. Here we go. Love 
say. Ready? We bring our eyes close to the camera. And we say. He could not please me better. Hanif, your turn. Ready, steady. Hanif, ready, steady. Aspen's turn, we Caspin, your turn. Caspin, your turn. Great. Uh, can you give me another thumbs up? Hopefully that you've seen it. Excellent. Good. Thank you. So, again, what you saw there, especially um, actually in that last little guy with his orange t-shirt, Caspin, uh, you saw the, the, the sensory experience, the, the, the feeling that, that, that everything is, um, is about to hurt, actually, is my experience of being with Caspin. Everything is about to be uh, something that's going to uh, be painful. And then just his mum just doing those gentle little plays and us making the little ting. And that's over Zoom, allowing him his own space and his own time to experience this game. The thing I really want to get through to people is that there is no, there's no one way to do this. We offer a very broad game that can be adapted to everybody who plays, no matter what their struggles are. And we had to then adapt it six months ago and are continuing to adapt it so that everything that we were used to doing, which was holding onto people's hands, rocking them, tipping them, jumping with them, we couldn't do anymore. But we still had the ideas of making eye contact and the rhythm of the heartbeat so it actually was very good for me because it made me understand again what it was that I'd created. The last element that I want to talk about is the physical experience of space. So we've talked about time and the struggle with time that someone on, who's autistic experiences, but it isn't just time that conspires against somebody. It's also space. The idea of putting one foot in front of the other can sometimes be too scary. The idea of stepping backwards into a space that you can't see is often impossible for someone who is autistic. So time and space will conspire against individuals who are autistic. 
the proprioceptive system in the body, which is our internal GPS, which is the system that allows us to see the door, go to the door and open it. That's very, very tender in someone who is autistic. It either seems not to be there at all, or it's certainly very, very impeded. And I've really understood that autism uh, shows itself at about two years old. And actually the proprioceptive system in a neurotypical two-year-old isn't developed. You don't let a two-year-old stand on the street because they might run into the, uh, well, they might run into the road and they might get run over and they might fall over. So the proprioceptive system is still developing this notion of being able to direct yourself, as is the vestibular system, the system that gives you balance, the system that filters sound and picture. So we developed uh, a trance game using a very, very old drama game uh, where you look to the hand of your partner and you follow that hand. And so if the hand goes up, you go up with your eyes and if the hand goes down, you go down with your eyes. And it became a game a long time ago for me, uh, fundamentally useful for people on the spectrum. It allows eye contact, but it's eye to hand. So it's a little bit safer, not so scary as having to look into someone's hand. And it allows the conversation of the body. So you don't need words to play this game, but you're literally offering the autistic individual's body the opportunity to direct itself. And I played with a young man a long time ago, uh, this trance game. And he said to me after about a week, I know you want me to step backwards, but I can't. I can't take a step backwards because it's too scary. I don't want to step back into the unknown, but I'd actually like to try. And I will never forget that morning. So he said, can you just put your hand there and give me a chance? Just give me some more time. So I said, yes. So then it took 10 minutes for him to pick up his foot with my hand here and place it behind his body. And as he was doing that, he was going, okay, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. And he started crying, he was sweating as if he was running a marathon. And all he was actually doing was picking up his foot and stepping it behind him where he couldn't see. He did it after 10 minutes and he was like, yes the whole room was crying and it felt like this huge event which it was in his life which i witnessed and it made me really fundamentally understand as i said that it isn't just time that people on the spectrum are really struggling with this work is right inside the essence of what it feels like to be autistic and offers a way to not to cure it, not to change it, but to explore all the parts, the facets of being a human being that the autism is, is sitting on, is, is blocking. So I want to show as the last video, um, the same thing, the trance game in the real space and how we adapted it to playing on the Zoom, where it became more a game of copying, but then you'll see a clip of our young friend, uh, Hanif, who miraculously for us, turned that trance on the Zoom into something that he could control. So here we go, here's the last, um, boom, boom.
Tosca. There we go. So hopefully you see how these games also, especially in those clips, take you into a different world, transform the space around you and the feeling around you so that you can go into another place. Art gives you the opportunity to be your best self, to not worry about the small things but actually to understand yourself and your place in the world and your relation to other people. And this marginalized community of autistic individuals who it would seem cannot communicate their thoughts and their feelings are given through this work a chance to be their best selves. And in that way, the power of theater, which doesn't have to include the spoken word, but actually has the conversation of the body and the soul inside it is being used to change the world. It changes the world for them. It changes the world, therefore, for their families and their parents who thought that their children were marginalized and couldn't communicate and thereby changes society because these people then feel part of society as opposed to feeling marginalized. So I'm going to pass back to Jackie, who's going to put us in our breakout rooms, but um, Two things. I will so happily take questions. I've been doing this for a very long time and it's always interesting to choose which bits to show people. So I've shown you kind of the tip of the iceberg, but also I have within that tip are the fundamentals of what I do. On our website, we have a whole section of how to play with us. So we have the videos of the actors saying how to play the games, uh, which you can watch and you can offer that to autistic individuals that you might know or work with or live with. I also have a book called Shakespeare's Heartbeat. And we also have many, many different 
uh, things on the website that also to do with our scientific research. We have neuroscientists who are using the games that I've invented to investigate the prefrontal cortex and what happens here. Um, but really the most important thing is it's a human endeavor and anybody can play. And I've now proved in the last six months that you can even play it from your kitchen table. So I hope I've given you a, a taste of what I do and I'll hand back to Jackie. Thank you, Kelly, for such a heartwarming demonstration of a little part of the enormity that you do and to change the world. And we can see really how that's happening. I wondered if anyone did want to ask any questions before we have an opportunity to go into our breakout rooms. Probably the best thing to do is to type that into the chat box. If there was something specifically you wanted to ask Kelly, and I know she's got some of her flute theatre group with us also tonight, which is really wonderful. So welcome to you guys, really great to have you here as well. If you would like to ask anything, have um, you can either unmute if you want to give us a wave <clears throat> uh, or write something in the chat. If there's anything specifically you'd like to know, either about Kelly and her crew's work with children or others on the spectrum or uh, how she's converted this work online. So there's a question from Jenny, hello. Uh, how do we use music in the sessions? Yeah, great question. So when I started, the music was really the language of Shakespeare. I was quite keen not to use any musical instruments. For the first 10 years, I never used any musical instruments, but there's a sing-song quality to the language. So even saying, I love you, ba-ba-ba, has, has notes in it. So language has tone, and rhythm and notes. So it's immediately musical in some way. And little by little, I work with very brilliant actors. I'm pretty musical myself. And uh, we started adding in music to add to the structure of support that the workshop offers. So we think of the work as a, as a web that's gonna a web of rhythm and tone that's going to catch the imagination and the interior rhythm of the person with autism and keep them there. So obviously the heartbeat itself is musical. Music doesn't come first, but the sing-song quality of language develops into the music. And in our shows, we use the music quite sparingly, but very, very um, hauntingly actually, and what we've also discovered over the years is a lot of people who are autistic will sing, but never speak. So we work with one young man called Marcus, who his mum told us sang all the Beatles songs in the bath when he was two or three, but never spoke a word. So music lands in another place of the brain, does it not? And we're tapping into that. However, we're tapping into feelings mostly. I call it yoga with feelings sometimes because it's moving the body, but it also has emotions attached. So it's never just a song, but it also has uh, a feeling attached to it. Another one of the guys that you saw, uh, Gabriel doing the heartbeats, he plays Bach preludes perfectly on the piano and yet is, has a very limited um, vocabulary. So music is inside all of us and inside people on the spectrum and we're trying to tap into it, but it isn't the first thing that we do. Uh, okay, I'm interested in the number of actors you have working with one child. How have you arrived at the number um, or benefits of that number? So the number of actors with a child, well, um, logistics mainly uh, dictates that. When I haven't had much money to do these projects, I've just been me with five or six children. When I've had good funding, then I've had at least one child and one actor together. And that's the idea, is that one actor will share their space with one child. And then sometimes we have a lot of very enthusiastic actors and a lot of drama students who work with me, but only one family turns up to a session. So then we'll have 15 actors and one child and a family. And oh, never mind. Um, there's there's no perfect number. It's harder if it's just one actor and lots of children and families, but it's not impossible. Uh, the ideal is one-on-one, -on -one. but actually sometimes two or three actors working 
with one child is what's needed. A game I didn't show you today, the tipping game, where in the real space we allow the children to, it's like a trough falling game, to tip backwards and forwards. That takes four actors for one autistic individual. Two actors are holding their feet, one is holding them as they go back and the other is holding them as they go forward. So the more the better. Uh, yeah, the more the better. And how many rehearsal sessions do you have with the group in the non-COVID conditions? Um, how many rehearsal sessions do you have with the group? Oh, so when we're doing our shows, uh, we don't rehearse with the children. One of the things I love about this work is the, is the slight danger involved or risk um, to the actors actually, because they have to really be on their metal. They've never met the children before. The doors swing open, 15 autistic individuals come in and the actors are sort of very busy, very quickly scanning what's the needs, what are the needs of this person who's then gonna sit with me and I'm gonna play with them for the next hour and a half. So we don't rehearse with them. However, we also have one major community project that we work with the same families and you saw quite a few of the same children in those clips. So that allows us to really, really get to know the child, the family and uh, develop our work as they develop as well. So it can be the lovely fusion of just meeting somebody for the first time or it can be a developed relationship. The prefrontal cortex, say any more about that, about that in the ASD children. Um, yeah, so I'm not a scientist. I am a theater artist. And the games are being researched by the neuroscientists at UCL. It's in a very early stage. And actually what we've done so far is uh, use uh, remote MRI scanners on neurotypical people, on the actors' brains, who then play the games to find out what's going on in the actors' brains so that we will then be able to put them on the um, heads of the children with autism. But we are miles away from that. And I'm not using, I'm not happy about using uh, autistic individuals as, as any sort of guinea pig. So, so we're, we're not there. Um, but what we are doing is using the games to investigate what happens in a neurotypical brain. And we found some amazing stuff there. Your, if you hear your name, more energy flows into your prefrontal cortex than listening to any other language. So we used that piece of golden nugget information to develop how we use the names of the autistic individuals. So you probably saw we sing their names a lot because therefore we know that something is happening in the prefrontal cortex here of any human being when you hear your name. As I said, it's, uh, Jackie, you'll have to invite me back so I can talk more about an entire thing about the, uh, the science of it. And can I say more about the iambic pentameter happily? Um, so the iambic pentameter is the rhythm that Shakespeare used to write his plays. It's actually a Greek metrical poetic rhythm that Chaucer first used in English. So it's not invented by Shakespeare, but it has five heartbeats to one line, which go ba boom ba boom ba boom ba boom ba boom. So any line of Shakespeare has those heartbeats running underneath it. And then depending on the feelings and the character's situation, uh, the, the rhythm changes. So you know whether you're in a natural state, if you're on the beat, Hamlet says, but break my heart for I must hold my tongue. Ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom. Fits perfectly on the iambic. But King Lear, when he's in his absolute apotheosis of grief says, never, 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 which doesn't fit on the iambic you, because it's on the offbeat. And so it tells us that Lear is exploding with grief and his heart broken. There's an amazing, uh, well, a world of poetic exploration. You could buy my second book called Cracking Shakespeare, which is all about how <laughs> um, uh, Shakespeare uses the, the iambic.
And how do we measure the outcomes of our sessions? Question from David Hennessy. You can't measure love. You can't measure the one-to-one -one experience that you have either in a real space or with uh, a person on Zoom. So we have evaluations and we have survey monkeys and the scientists uh, are finding out more and more about the interior rhythms by sometimes putting sweat bands on the participants and seeing what their heart rate is. But truly for me, this is a theatre practice and theatre practices are the oldest practices in the world. And you can't ever truly put a number, put a pie chart or a measuring gauge on what happens with these individuals and the actors. Now that's not to say that we don't measure it in some way, but I always say to people who are engaged in this work, um, don't judge it, don't be the critic of it, don't be the measurer actually, but be uh, someone who is gonna share it with the person in the room, of course. To develop it and to show others, you need equations and measurements. Um, but right now, today in this pandemic, I'm more concerned with making sure that I can reach people. Because the thing that is absolutely essential to remember is those kids that you saw on the videos, they're very lucky because their families are able to bring them to these sessions and they have an internet connection at home or they have the wherewithal to get to the theater or to get to the school. But there's an entire group of people who are so marginalized that no one can actually reach them. And that's the work that I push for is uh, our grassroots work, which was Probably the thing I'm most proud of, which we did in the summer, you saw that lovely girl with the long blonde hair called Elise, who was in the family's houses. She knocked on their door, which was obviously arranged, and went round there, set up the computer, and was our person in their houses. Because sometimes this work means that you have to go the extra mile and make sure that the marginalised are being met and not expect them to come to you. And I don't know how to measure that. That's more of a social activism and that's something that I'm just very keen on. Kelly, that's so wonderful. Thank you for answering those questions. What we'd like to do is give Kelly another opportunity to, to have a final word before we finish up in just over five minutes. But we also want to give you a chance to connect in directly with two or three other people tonight. So Aidan's just going to invite you into a breakout room just for about five minutes. And what I'd like you to do is to reflect if you could on one thing that you've gained particularly out of hearing what Kelly shared tonight. And if you are working with those or uh, living with people with ASD, one way that you could apply some of this or one question you might have further. So I'll put you in those rooms now and we'll see you in about five minutes. Would anyone like to unmute and say something briefly about what they chatted about in their group? Sarah, would you like to? Sarah Oldfield. Um, we just chatted a bit about how we found this information session really useful. Um, Julie discussed how she's a psychologist. Um, she works with um, infants and she said she was looking, she's dealt with autistic children before, but this is something that could be used for future. Um, I'm hoping to be a psychologist um, and it's really opened my eyes to possibly being a drama therapist as well. Um, just because there's such an important need to help people in alternative ways that a lot of people don't think of. Um, Kelly brought up a beautiful point which has been highlighted today is that we all have access to internet and a lot of people don't um, so it's important to provide these services to people who don't so possibly I was thinking like discussing about how it's important that a lot of people know about alternative therapies so they can help people in rural and remote areas of Australia yeah wonderful great Just great chairing Kelly, do great work <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, and Natalie McKenzie, I wondered if you would like to say something really briefly about what you got out of tonight too. Yeah, hi. Um, so I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm a drama therapist and um, I, uh, I am 
I'm working with a, a young adult and I've been working with him for many years and he will only ever speak when we play. Um, and, uh, and so a lot of your work, Kelly, just kind of confirms, I'm, I'm going to go and look at a lot more of what you're up to because, um, uh, it, it, he kind of chanced upon drama and, um, and now he, yeah, it's, it's amazing sort of, um, we, I haven't used the heartbeat, but we use a, a we enter into a curtain and, um, and when we enter into the curtain, when we enter into play, um, he, his words come. So, um, yeah, it was wonderful to hear you speak. <laughs> Please, please uh, keep in touch with me, Meb. I'm sure Jackie will share my contact details and, and do keep in touch. And we we'll have performances of our next show online on Zoom oh, wow. um, of Midsummer Night's Dream. So you could bring him to one. So they're for one autistic individual at a time. And uh, that, that, well, a lot of the footage that you were just watching is from our show that we did in the summer of, of Pericles. And now we're doing the dream. So he might really love that. So you're so welcome. Just keep in touch Thank with you. me and yeah, and bring him. That would be great. Thank you so much, Kelly. And we'll put all your contact details up on the site along yes. with this edited recording. Um, so thank you for sharing those. There's just a few final things I'd like to share with you before we wind up for tonight and do a final thank you. And Kelly, we would like if you were able and willing to come back and do some other webinars for us in the future. It was so well received tonight and I can see everyone smiling, nodding, um, certainly supporting that, that idea. Just to let you know, in a couple of weeks, we've got another free webinar, Supervision as a Super Meeting of Visionaries. So that's on the website now. If you'd like to register, you're more than welcome to join us for this also. And a final thing we have is Natalie, who just very kindly shared about her experience, is running a Welcome to Drama Therapy workshop on Monday. And we have just a few spaces left. And I'd like to gift one to somebody tonight. Oh, well, thank you all for being here tonight. It's lovely to see you. Kelly, would you like the last word in finishing up for tonight? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for listening and, and um, responding so beautifully. It's 10 o'clock in the morning here or 11 now. So you've made my day. And as I said, please reach out to me and my company if you either want to know more about what we do or you'd like to bring an autistic individual of any age and any um, ability to one of our performances of A Midsummer Night's Dream. All the details are on the website. It's free if they're struggling. There's no charge if people are struggling. And we would absolutely love to see you and them there. For me, reaching our arms across the oceans and connecting with the world right now is, is absolutely vital. So thank you so much and mm. keep in touch. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank you. thank you so much, Kelly. It's really been a, a very inspiring night for us. So thank you and we'll see you again.